Hello, and welcome to another Sagatok Scribes interview. The West, this Westport Library series highlights Westport authors and their newest books. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Paul Bakaleknik and Bakalek. Kelly Rudin, who will be discussing Paul's new novel, Carrie's Secret. Before we get into the interview, here's a little information about these two. Paul is the author of two psychological reads. He grew up in Westport, attended university, earned his graduate degrees at Boston College and Boston University. He worked in psychiatric and rehab facilities, and then information and internet technology before turning to writing. You can find him virtually at Paul Bacalenic, Bacalenic, dot com where where you join his blog writingamystery.com. Kelly Rudenbeer in the book business has included bookstores, publishing, and libraries, including the Westport Library. Has been leading book discussions for over 25 years, including 17 of those spent with the library's mystery group, The Usual Suspects. Kelly also serves as a member of various town profit advisory committees. So without further ado, welcome to you both. Thank you, Jennifer. So, Paul, welcome back to Westport. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, it's a pleasure I'd to love to start. Virtually. Oh yes, and it's so nice to meet you virtually. Um, I'd love to start with Westport uh, because you're a graduate of Staples High School. True. And you've noted a big influence uh, from your time there. And I can't resist uh, the opportunity to give a shout out to a teacher. So I wonder if we could start there. Well, a shout out to a teacher in Westport would be to Dick Leonard, who had the AP English class in high school. And uh, he's a terrific teacher. I think he's gone now, unfortunately. But uh, he made a difference. He was the most supportive, uh, kind of uh, liberal uh, open-minded, um, intelligent uh, English teacher I had. Um, well, Russ Kerr also was was a was a positive influence in junior high school at Long Lots Junior High School. Mm -hmm. But uh, Dick Leonard, I think, would would be the the, the local teacher that um, had the most uh, important uh, influence on me. Just to, just that he encouraged my writing, encouraged me to speak up. Uh, to believe that what I had to say was of value. So I, I really treasured that, uh, that relationship, his teaching. Well, and from that early influence, it took you a little while to get back to writing. Yeah, yeah. it did. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I was uh, more interested in earning a living and supporting myself and, and uh, yeah. my, my wife um, than I was on uh, uh, on writing, although it was always a, going on in the background, I was forever making notes for uh, writing ideas. I have, you know, files full of um, possible titles, plot ideas, characters. You know, they've been swirling around in my head for many years. It was only, uh, I guess, about um, maybe, you know, eight or 10 years ago that I finally started to really write seriously. And so it's been, it was quite a quite a bit of time elapsed before I actually began to write. But I like to think that some life experience uh, was of value in the writing. So maybe that, that was the good reason to wait. <laughs> well, speaking of that, uh, tell me a little bit about the setting of the novel and uh, the idea that led you to this story. Okay, Carrie's Secret is, is primarily set in, in a mental hospital in Massachusetts. Um, my degree from Brown was in psychology. And so that was certainly a, a first and a, and a deep interest of mine, mental health. And uh, so after, after graduating from, from Brown, I, I moved to Boston and worked in a, in a rehab facility for a couple of years. I became a, a counselor in, in their methadone clinic and I worked with heroin addicts uh, for a year. So I had a sense of, of their struggles and humanity. And then I went on to work in, in two different, yeah, two different, two different psychiatric hospitals, uh, one in Brookline and another um, uh, in uh, Wellesley. And uh, so I had a total of about 14 years uh, working uh, in psychiatric hospitals. Plus, oh, I shouldn't neglect this. Um, during, during my college years, one summer, I worked at Hallbrook in Westport. So that was actually my very first you know, sort of hands-on experience with, with uh, you 
know, a, a mentally ill population. So I really got a sense of um, how uh, how those those patients varied and and uh, struggled and and were treated, and uh, those that could be helped and those that that weren't particularly helped. I mean, I really got a, a an early exposure to the field. And uh, it stayed in the back of my mind. And some of the, the characters and some of the uh, ideas I experienced there at Hallbrook worked, it, worked their way into one or two of the, the patients that we find in Carrie's Secret. But most of Carrie's Secret was, was based on the real life experience I had later uh, after college in, in those two um, hospitals in Massachusetts. So they formed a, a background that, you know, some of the characters were, some of the behavior were stuck in my memory and, and they, you know, uh, you know, a patient who said something unusual or, or witty um, and was unexpected. You know, patients can surprise you. It's amazing what, you know, how human and unpredictable they really are in, in positive ways. And uh, so it was, uh, they, some of those stories literally appear in the book. Of course, a lot of it is fiction, but uh, some of it was, was found in, in real life. Maybe that's so what that's what really uh, comes first to you in the process of writing a novel? Is it the plot first, or is it the setting, or do the characters come to you first? <laughs> well, actually, in the case of Carrie's Secret, I'm on my third novel now, and each one has a different genesis. But Carrie's Secret, I remembered an incident where two schizophrenic patients, in my experience, at uh, at the um, hospital in, that I worked at in Wellesley, mm -hmm. were speaking to each other. And I was an aide in that unit. And I heard this little conversation take place. Um, and it's, and it, is, it is used in the book. And it just struck me with how interesting. I guess I can quote it. It's, it's a little bit raunchy. But uh, <laughs> if, you, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll repeat, I'll repeat, repeat the, the tale. I mean, it's in the book. So might as well be in the interview as well. Um, <laughs> One, one uh, young man who was actually had been uh, a student at Harvard when he had a complete psychotic breakdown and got hospitalized and, and was determined to be chronically schizophrenic from then on. He was only about 18 years old when he was in the hospital. And he's having a conversation in the hallway right in front of me with another patient, a somewhat older guy in his early 20s. And this first guy says to, says to the second, um, what did he say? He said, um, why do pigs fuck? That was his question, as I told you. And the second guy thinks about it for a minute, and he says, I don't know, because they're making bacon? He says. <laughs> and I just grinned at that. And then the first one said, no, no, that's not it. It's because they're fucking pigs, <laughs> which is a double entendre. Right, yeah. <laughs> and and I, I, I was struck by that. I just, first of all, that they could be kind of intriguingly witty and smart and funny. And, uh, you know, maybe he was, you know, the first guy was saying something that was angry, in fact, but it still was such a unusual and clever little uh, exchange mm -hmm. that it stayed in my brain for the next 20 years. In fact, there is one of those little unusual memories, one among many of, of um, how patients can surprise you, yeah. and I and I just wanted to use it. So I had no idea where the book was going. I had no idea what the plot would eventually be when I I wrote that down. And I said somehow this is going to get incorporated into this story. So that determined for me the setting. Mm -hmm. So the setting of the next book would be a mental hospital, and it to me that wasn't an unusual place because I'd spent so much time working in them. But it turns out to be something that is very unusual for other people to read about and to get a realistic portrayal of, of psychiatric hospitals then and now, they're not that different, um, uh, was a useful uh, and intriguing place for people to read about. Anyway, long story short, it started with, with that, uh, that little scene in real life. So well, I'd, I'd like to talk thing. about another scene. I'd like to talk about the opening because it okay. really grabs the reader from the start. Thank you. Um, and I know that you've mentioned that you feel like the first sentence and the first chapter are so crucial, which of course, absolutely. 
So well, I yeah, especially I'm just trying to remember exactly how it did begin. I may look here. Chapter one. I have my copy here. <laughs> oh, I thought I would never see her again. Yeah, I, I remember it, of course. This is the third version of a beginning that this book went through. It, it, I, I had to really juggle it around, you know, and, and the, I won't say the others at the moment. Maybe we'll get to that later. But this particular beginning um, starts with um, the, the antagonist, the, the, the evildoer, you know, cursing the fact that this girl gets admitted to the hospital where he works. And um, that's an intense and dangerous discovery that he makes. He has done something terrible to this girl's family and she was the only witness to what he did. So she comes into this hospital and he's working there and he suddenly looks and says, oh my God, I thought I'd never see her again. And here she is, this witness whom I intimidated and I felt controlled and look what she's, she's arrived here and in, in, in a mental hospital, her, her stresses and experiences may emerge and I could be in a lot of trouble. So um, that was the opening scene, and and I glad to hear it grab you, and as as I've heard from other readers that it did as well. So, absolutely. Uh, it's a, um, you it's know, as scene. as the narrator, it reminded me a little uh, touch about uh, Agatha Christie's murder of Roger Ackroyd a bit. Um, did it? So, I'm flattered yeah. to be mentioned um, in the same company as yeah. a master. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how how did this character reveal himself to you? Um, well, that's a good question. I don't know where I found him. You know, I've read so many, you know, mysteries and thrillers where, where um, there's a very smart, dangerous sociopath uh, who is, is the cause of, of, of the crimes that, are, that appear in those stories. So I just needed someone um, to be... Uh, a dangerous threat uh, and, and a smart, difficult person to um, to identify as, as the criminal for the for the police and the and the readers. So you know the whole mystery. It is a mystery, and the whole mystery is you know who is who is this guy <laughs> who did that. So I tried to find somebody who um, could pull off a crime like this and yet be a, a successful uh, uh, employee in this hospital. Um, so, so you that. you made him uh, you made him a listener to classical music, which I thought was very interesting as a character you, trait. No, good, uh, good. You know, how how did you position this uh, to give us well, insight into You have character? to give some balance to your characters. You can't have somebody be purely evil. They need some humanity for a reader to relate to, not necessarily to like them, but at least to find them more multifaceted. So I tried to think of a, of a trait that he could do in isolation because he's not going to be a social guy. He's not going to work well with other people, play well with other people, certainly. And so I needed to give him a hobby or an interest that was both intellectual and intriguing and slightly humanizes him to balance the evil that he does. And I think that I think you always want to have your characters be well-rounded. As much as I can, I try to give some negative traits to my good characters and some, you know, uh, positive traits to my evil characters if I can. So that was the thinking there. I just plucked it out of the air. I had no reason to think. So my father always liked classical music. So not that he's modeled on my father, certainly, <laughs> but my father always liked classical music. So I kind of imagined that as a, as a positive trait I could employ. And it could be background music as he's working and so forth. It was, sort of aligns with the show don't tell uh, theory yeah. of writing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a practitioner as much as I can be. I just, I, I've realized that if I can think of my books as, um, as if you're watching a movie, mm -hmm. you know, the movie shows action. You don't, you don't have them standing aside and explaining what they're doing and why they're doing it. They simply do it and they're mm -hmm. showing it. So if I can envision scenes as being almost in a movie, then I can show <laughs> less than tell because I'm thinking that way. So I try to try to 
bring that into it. Yeah, showing, don't tell. You can bore people to death with telling. <laughs> so you're much better off showing. <laughs> So there, there are so many threads in this story. Um, how do you keep all of that straight in your process? You know, I don't know. I, I read my books. My last, these first two books I wrote have such complex plots. I think, how did I think of that? I, I don't know. I mean, they just, one thing triggers another and, um, and it has to tie together and make sense logically. I mean, I want books to be realistic and there's always many things going on in everyone's lives and everyone has individual, you know, roads they're traveling down. And, and if you bring a character in, he's got something going on in his life or she has something going on in her life and, you know, and desires and wishes and things. So if you let yourself pursue any of those, you add a new storyline. Um, I don't know if that clarifies it exactly, except that you can't go off on long distance tangents that don't help, don't help the story. The subplots are, are important, but um, if you can tie them back to each other and the important thing about Carrie's secret is there are two major plot lines, two crimes, and I wanted to bring them together. And obviously they come together very, very clearly, but how I thought of that, I wish I had the magic answer because I would do it again and again. <laughs> And uh, I don't know how I do it. Somehow it, 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 uh, it comes to me that there are these connections to be made. And it's interesting. It so, sounds like uh, you, I'm sure you've heard the terms are, are you a plotter or a pantser? Meaning, do you go by the seat of your pants or do you plot everything out? And it sounds like you're a pantser. I am a pantser until my latest book. This book now that I'm working on, I, I, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I'll just let me say that uh, it's tentatively called Empty Luck, and it's a couple, of, a group of guys, one of whom is a character from Fairy Secret, and they go off to Las Vegas, and they get into trouble with a kind of a mafioso-type character, and I've painted them into a corner now. I'm about a fifth of the way through the book, maybe 15,000 words, and I can't see to my pants out of it. <laughs> I haven't been able to figure out how to untangle this plot so that they can get out of the situation I've put them in. So now for the first time in my writing career, brief though it is, I am trying to outline the, the situation so that, that I can see where it will go because I could just see them my pants themselves into getting them shot. <laughs> I don't want that to happen. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a ch it's a challenge. But yes, I, I'm 90% seat of the pants kind of writer. In fact, I just I wrote a post. It isn't in my blog yet, but it'll be in my writingamystery.com blog where I talk about the process of writing. And, and this next post is going to be uh, about um, choosing to outline in certain situations where you just have to figure it out ahead of time. Oh, let me say one last thing and then I'll, I'll stop on the outline question. I think with mysteries and suspense, you almost need to have a pretty good sense of where you're going with the book. I think other kinds of novels, maybe less so, but the kind of novels I try to write, um, I think require some kind of um, structure that you can work out a little bit ahead of time. But usually it's just in my head and I'm kind of going along getting there, but it ha I haven't written it down. But this one I did, this latest one I did, not Carrie's Secret. Well, so. um, Ernest Hemingway once said that the only kind of writing is rewriting. Uh, <laughs> what do you think of that? <laughs> he has a funny, uh, succinct way of putting things, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's so true. Huh? Yeah, it's true. Right. So, so you mentioned uh, that you wrote the beginning three times. How much did Carrie's secret change from your first draft? Oh my God. Um, well, on my computer, there are 39 drafts of Carrie's secret. <laughs> <laughs> wow. They're not major changes. Sometimes I would just do something, you know, a, rewrite a chapter or two, but I would want to save the old one. So I kept having versions and I actually ended up with 39 versions before I came to one that I that felt was finished. Um, but the structure where I moved chapter eight to chapter one, Carrie, the, the chapter that it begins with now was originally chapter eight, that she didn't, you know, uh, the, the character didn't 
you know, go out the window and get assaulted and go out the window that way until, uh, you know, 50 pages into the book or something. But um, so another one, I mean, without being a spoiler here, <laughs> I will say that uh, originally the book began with her older sister's abduction. Uh, Wendy, the older sister, Carrie's older sister, who's a, uh, a teenager three years older than Wendy, uh, three years older than Carrie, excuse me, uh, is, is literally abducted by someone and uh, taken out of her home. But that, that's, that's a much later chapter now because it's a flashback. And uh, I didn't want to start the book with that. I wanted to start with the action. The, most of the book is focused on Carrie and it's entitled Carrie's Secret. So it's about Carrie primarily. And um, so I thought it was a little misleading to start with um, with the other one, even though that that's a good scene too, I've been told. Yes. Um, yeah. And that's the story. There. Yes. Uh, are there special considerations you make when writing female characters? Oh, it's as funny a man? you should ask that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I have I belong to a writers group, and uh, it's prim mostly women and me, <laughs> <laughs> and they forever are showing me the, the feminist perspective. It's good for me to think that way. It helps me to think that way. And when they read a draft of, of this book, they told me it failed the, and I can't remember the exact name, something like the Wallace Bendix test. <laughs> That's not the right name, Benedict or something like that. But anyway, there's some sort of test where you have to have two female characters who talk to each other about something other than a man. Okay. That has to be a scene. Otherwise you fail this particular feminist test. And my book originally failed the test. So I thought, where can I put a scene in? I want to want to listen to that. So where can I put a scene in the book where, um, you know, two women are talking. So I have uh, the two, two of the nurses discussing their careers and couldn't care less about a man. And, and my uh, hero comes up, he likes one of the nurses and he's sort of standing there awkwardly alongside them and trying to, you know, join in and, and they want nothing to do with them. They want to talk <laughs> to each other about getting master's degrees in nursing and what their career can lead to and so forth. So um, yes, I try to, you know, improve my, my um, view of women. For what it's worth, my first book development uh, had a lot more uh, scenes with women and, in, uh, from, and, and written some of it from the female perspective, which I had a sense of somehow. Uh, maybe it's growing up with three sisters <laughs> and no <laughs> brothers and <laughs> no something of what uh, the feminine side of things a little bit. Absolutely. So, um, if, if you were to meet your protagonist, what would you say to them? Oh my God, my <laughs> protagonist. I'd say, first of all, I say, cheer up. Things aren't so gloomy all the time. He's a very, uh, he's a poor character. Who, my, my protagonist is Jared. He's the character I spend the most time with. Um, He's uh, at this point in Carrie's Secret, he's I think he's 29 years old. Um, he's still working as an aide in the psychiatric hospital, which is a fairly low paying job. Um, and um, he's, um, he's not really happy in the relationship he's, he's in, the woman he's living with, although there's nothing wrong with her and she cares for him, but he's, he's un unhappy with his life. He's unhappy with his somewhat unhappy with his work. He struggled with addiction. So he's having a hard time just kind of stepping outside of his, his own limited uh, life. And I want to say to him, life can be so much more. It can be so much richer and, and more satisfying if you'd stop sabotaging yourself, and, you know, make things better. So, um, you know, I'd like to help him. He's in this next book, the same character reappears and, and the one I'm tentatively calling empty luck. And he's, um, he's more just kind of observing now and, and trying to stay out of trouble and trying to um, begin to think about getting his life together. But it's about time. He's 30 years old by then. And, you know, so I would say to him, snap out of it. <laughs> Straighten out, get your life better. You can do it. 
So, well, I, although each of your your novels is a standalone, um, there are some recurring characters. That's true. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, Jared in particular, um, in some ways, he's probably the closest to me. I, I'm not so, thankfully, he's not an autobiographical character, but some of what he goes through, you know, I can re relate closely to and is, is, you know, especially in development in high school, it was a lot of what my high school was like, except for the extreme drug use and so forth that he gets involved in. But, you know, his relationships with women and his, you know, his struggles with school and so forth, you know, some of that really connected for me. So he's, he's, um, he's a recurring character. Um, now, there are, there are characters in the first book in development that people have asked me about what really happens to his girlfriend who gets pregnant in that book and has a child. We don't see her again, but can we see her again? You know, people want to know. Um, the only other character that repeats, I think, is is a friend of his uh, from from Westport, <laughs> where, where development is set. Uh, from that uh, from that story is his friend um, Dick, and uh, Jared moves to Boston and lives initially with Dick and gets some involvement with Dick, plays cards with Dick. But um, other than some mention of Jared's parents, no, there aren't any other characters that that uh, come back. But I think um, I may want to bring them back in this next book because people ask about them. They get they start to care about the characters, and I couldn't ask for more. If if people really care about characters and want to see them again, I need to bring them back for them. And and you know, and also because life circles back often, you know, and and I want the book to be books to be realistic I want more than anything I want my books to feel realistic I want people to feel like oh I could see why this person made that choice I, it seems like a wrong choice but I can understand why they might do it you know it has to feel believable nothing is more important in my opinion yeah. well and, and relatable so yeah, which right. absolutely yeah. um, I think that's true um, and you mentioned a little bit in your process that you think in a filmic way. So I'm curious if Carrie's Secret were a movie, who would you cast? Oh my goodness, what a fantasy. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Carrie would have to be a fairly young actress. I, I don't know who that might be. Um, uh, who would play... Um, the, the antagonist who we won't name because that would be a major spoiler no, no spoilers <laughs> but the bad guy <laughs> who would play the bad guy is I don't know um, Billy Bob Thornton comes to mind he might be a good character for that um, I could see him having a sort of uh, evil intrigue you know um, who would play Jared it needs to be somebody kind of young and and open-minded uh, for some reason ryan reynolds comes to mind i don't know if you know him but i can see him in that role i i, I literally haven't thought of this before not literally casting carrie secret but this is spontaneous thoughts um and who else who else do we have to do well we need a pretty nurse i don't know who that would be but some, we need a nicole. some young ingenue yeah nicole it needs to be a a, a very innocent lovely person um at least innocent appearing uh, so, but I can't think of an actress. I can't think, I can't cast the female roles, it seems, <laughs> but I have an idea for the major male, male roles. There are really great female roles in the novel, though, so that's... There that's are some good ones, yeah, there definitely are. The two sisters, uh, Wendy and Carrie, are, are, are critical, you know, you need very good actresses to play those. Those are difficult roles, I think. Mm -hmm. They would be, because they're, you know, Wendy suffers, but she fights back in her own way, and yeah. You know, Carrie goes through a lot of emotions, very emotional person. And so it would have need to be somebody with quite a range of emotion yeah. and uh, sensitivity. So I don't know. Absolutely. I'd have to speak to the casting director on that one. <laughs> <laughs> fun well, fun I, to fantasize about. It is. It is. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, since we're in November, I feel I have to ask if you have ever participated in NaNoWriMo, which for anyone that's uninitiated, uh, that's otherwise known as National Novel Writing Month. And uh, folks are challenged to write 50,000 words during the month of November. 
<laughs> oh my God. <laughs> no, I didn't know about National Rimo, <laughs> Nano Rimo. Uh, 50,000 words in a month would be, they wouldn't be my best 50,000 words, I can tell you that. Because uh, uh, as, as Hemingway uh, said, as you pointed out, there's a lot of rewriting <laughs> to be done. And, and my work gets a lot better as I rewrite it. It's, it's never its best. Sometimes the dialogue. I think dialogue comes out very naturally for me. That's that's a one of my easier parts of writing. But the rest of it, all the description and the, you know the the scenes, they they take work. They take a lot of work to to read well and st stay interesting. So no, I I wouldn't even attempt fifty thousand words in a month. If I write fifty thousand words in a year, I'm doing well <laughs> these days. <laughs> Absolutely. Ned, do you use a software writing program or you just straight? No, I, I mean, I just use Word. I write, you know, Microsoft Word. I write on the computer. Um, I don't know how some, how in the world Herman Melville ever wrote uh, Moby Dick. I cannot imagine how, you know, Charles Dickens, how these people wrote in those days, Mark Twain. I mean, they must have used a lot of paper and effort and time. And, and did they ever feel like they got it right? I mean, Thank God we have, you know, digital, you know, tools now. You can you can keep rewriting and, and tinker with with things. And I don't know. It's uh, it staggers me what people must have gone through. Writers, you know, pre pre computer. But, well, know, it, it's just, really clear when say you go to the Morgan Library and they have some of those original manuscripts. Oh and you almost can see the process, you know, much think. more because there's all these cross outs and, you know. How could there not be? I don't know. How. <laughs> Nobody gets it right, you know, day one. You know, you can't. So, yeah. You know, and I think I it's sentences really, around all the time, you know, just it, within a paragraph, I'll say, you know, a third sentence in will actually say what I wanted to say at the beginning and, you know, just slip it around and keep um, tweaking it, you know, to get it to read well. Anyway. So. Absolutely. so you you chose to publish the book yourself. And I, I had a lot of choice. You know, mm -hmm. I, I wrote to agents and uh, I didn't write any publishers directly, but I tried to approach agents. And that's like knocking on a, you know, Fort Knox or something. You can't get in. At, mm -hmm. at least I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And I, I hear that's very true these days where, you know, hundreds of thousands of books are published every year. And, and you know, unless you already have a big readership, if you're Stephen King, I'm sure you can find another agent. <laughs> but if, if you're Paul Bacalemic, no, it's it's really tough. So I'm I'm trying that approach. Now this time around where I have a track record, I have, you know, books on Amazon that have been well received and, you know, a lot of good quotes from people. Um, you know, maybe it's time to uh, try it again um, and see if I can get a legitimate publisher I'm willing to to look into that because I think the benefit of a publisher is they get you into bookstores, you know, and they get you known. I mean, you still have to do your own promotion. It sounds like, and, you know, I try to do what I can in that area. It's a, a headache and a half really yeah. promoting your own work. It's not something I don't think most authors enjoy doing, but you almost have to nowadays, you know, with Facebook and with, you know, mailing lists and so forth. That, that is something that's really evolved uh, because yeah. I, I worked at Random House when all the social media and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, having a website, all of that really started. And yeah. it, it was a big learning curve for a lot of authors. And, uh, and certainly mm -hmm. marketing your own work is a challenge for all authors now, uh, those that are published by a big house or uh, published themselves, they all really take on a fair amount of that part. Um, I, I have so heard that, that like even to, with a publisher, yeah. Well, I'd love you to tell a little bit more about your blog and your social media strategy. Okay, well, this is the marketing side of things. Um, the blog was really kind of a, a fun project for me. It, it, it has the side benefit, hopefully, of, of promoting my work. But really, um, what I was thinking of when I wrote the blog was, this is just as I'm going through the process of writing a book, why don't I share that with people? Somebody might find that interesting. Other writers, uh, readers who are interested in, in, uh, uh, in the writing process. So as I struggle with plot decisions or I learn more about incorporating 
the senses into um, my writing, you know, um, I, 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 I jot down a few paragraphs about it and post it and, and say, here's the latest thinking I have on, on, that, on that subject. So um, it's just sharing my own learning curve with other people. I, I, I see no harm in it, whether it's a useful strategy to, <laughs> you know, help create readership, I, I have no idea. Um, you know, I, I have a fairly small number of people who subscribe to that blog at the moment, but, uh, you know, if I could get more, it would be, it, it could be, you know, worthwhile doing. Um, more importantly, in terms of um, uh, my promotional work, um, you know, I do have an account on Twitter, an account on Facebook, you know, um, uh, on, I'm on Goodreads, I'm in BookBub, I'm in all these different uh, sites. Um, um, we, I can't even remember some of the others, um, but um, I'm trying to just get myself have so that I have a presence on these other places, so that if somebody Google's my name, maybe it comes up and they, it leads them to my books. Um, the the principal way I've I've tried to market so far has been via a mailing list. I have six or seven hundred names of people that I think are interested in knowing, you know, about my work, and so I uh, lately I've decided I'm going to produce a regular newsletter and I've just done issue one <laughs> and it went out to, you know, 600 people. Um, and, you know, some of them, you know, as a result, subscribe to the blog and as a result, um, you know, uh, uh, bought, bought one of the books or both books, you know, so it, it it's, um, it's tricky because you don't want to be flagrantly Ad, you know, promotional, you know, a good newsletter is about 90% entertaining and interesting and useful to the reader and less about the writer, you know, so I've tried to put together a newsletter that, that has some humor and has some uh, uh, interest as well as a pitch for, for my book. So uh, thus far, that's pretty much what I've done. Um, I have a whole long list of things to do for marketing. Because if you just, you know, Google the subject, marketing your book, you'll get a zillion different uh, places that will help you with that. You know, I'm trying to do it on a shoestring. I mean, I can spend money, but I'm trying to limit my expenditures. I did send off to Kirkus to get a review there, you know, and that was a $400 investment. So that's not trivial to me. Um, but a, a good review from them, which they won't do for a while, and there's a long waiting list and so forth. But whenever they do it, if it's a good review, that, that should help me. Um, you know, I'd love to figure out ways to get into a Barnes and Noble and so forth, but uh, I don't know how that's done. <laughs> I'm still learning. <laughs> it's all I can do to learn how to be a writer, let alone learn how to be a marketer. <laughs> so it's a, a dual challenge I've had given to myself in life. I'm, I'm so looking forward to the newsletter. Uh, oh, great. Yeah, well, uh, I'll, I'll make list. sure you subscribe. <laughs> What's that? I said, you can uh, add me to the list. <laughs> I shall. I absolutely will, Kelly. Thank you. So, and, uh, Do you want to get the blog as well? I'll give you Oh, yeah. No, I've, I've looked at the blog, and I, I'll put myself on a subscription to that. Um, right. I thought it was really helpful. There's a lot of really good advice for writers on it, so I would encourage people to subscribe. Really? Oh, great. great. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. So <laughs> and on a personal note, you're a traveler um, and, and like so many of us, I'm sure that your plans have been upended and uh, sidelined for the present moment. So for a little armchair travel moment, um, I'd love to know if you've ever made a literary pilgrimage or if there is a trip like that that you hope to make. Ooh, a literary pilgrimage? No, I hadn't considered one, but... Uh... I'll have to think of where I would go. You know, my wife's an artist, and so she's inclined to make artistic pilgrimages. I think we would be more likely to go to, um, I don't know, Arles in France and see where um, Van Gogh painted. But um, a literary pilgrimage, where would we go? Maybe to uh, back to Paris. I love Paris. We've been there three or four times. Um, that feels like a literary destination. I don't know, where else would we go? Uh, Key West and see where... Uh, Hemingway wrote <laughs> something, sure. you know, we were gonna, we, we would have, we planned a trip this summer and the COVID virus, you know, uh, interrupted that also to France. We were gonna take a barge trip in, uh, from Strasbourg uh, in Alsace-Lorraine 
you know, a nice little uh, cultural barge trip up uh, up uh, one of the rivers. I don't remember which one, but uh, that was all scheduled and paid for, and we were all excited to go in June, and then it's uh, it was canceled. We had to cancel it. Couldn't travel there. So this is the first year in many years that I won't have taken a trip anywhere. You know, I mean, we pretty much try to get somewhere every year. You know, uh, so I I miss that, but. Uh, yeah, so that may be the silver idea. silver lining is you have a little bit more time for writing and working on the third novel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a good we'll try to think of it like that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, Paul, thank, thank you, you so much. Um, I think we managed to get through without any spoilers, which I'm very proud of. Um, mm -hmm. It's never an easy thing to do uh, when you really want to talk about the book. Um, and I'm really glad to have met you and discovered your work. Um, and I look forward to the next novel. Thank you, Kelly. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Well, th I would like to thank you both for sharing your time on behalf of the Westport Library. This was such a fun interview and meeting between the two of you. So for those of you watching this video, remember that you can order Carrie's Secret through your favorite uh, website or borrow it from the Westport Library. For more author videos and events and information about the library, remember to watch westportlibrary.org. Thank you both so much for this. Thank you. <laughs>